Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you so much for joining us for Wait Just an InfoSec this week. My name is John Hubbard, and uh, at the Sands Institute, I am a senior instructor, co-author of a couple of security operations center courses, uh, Sec 450 and Management 451. I'm the cyber defense curriculum lead. And with all of that being said, as you might imagine, today we are going to be talking about security operations as one of our core focuses for today. Uh, navigating the future of the SOC, risk and opportunities is going to be our uh, future segment where we're going to get to in just a little bit here. Uh, as we warm up here, I wanted to let you know kind of what the plan was. Uh, we're going to be going through some cybersecurity news. We're going to be talking about some of the most important headlines of the week. And then eventually we're going to get to where I'm going to bring in some guests and we're going to talk about what we find to be the most uh, exciting opportunities and the trends and some of the risks and threats that we see uh, that are going to be a, a big issue for security operations centers. Um, who I'm bringing on is some of the other uh, uh, co-authors and instructors uh, for these classes. So together, we're going to kind of talk about what we've seen through our consulting businesses and kind of some of our other uh, just kind of experience talking with students from uh, industries and in various organization sizes around the world. So uh, for now, I want to say a big welcome to everyone. I see we have a ton of people joining here from all around the world. I see Alan from Newton, Massachusetts. Hello. We got Stephen from Maryland. I got a good evening from a, I can't tell who the name is, but someone from somewhere where it's evening. Thank you for joining us in the evening. Uh, Florida, we've got James. Uh, we also have James from Belgium. Awesome. So we got people from uh, Canada, India, Austria, Maryland, Berlin, St. Louis, Missouri. Hello, Nepal. Awesome. Thank you for joining us from Nepal. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon from Nigeria. Hello. We got Nigeria in the house. Mahesh from UAE. Hello. Was just over in Dubai not too long ago. Had a great time over there. Got Marquise from Atlanta. Slovakia, Lagos, Nigeria. I love that this is such an international crowd. It's so cool seeing some of these on. I've watched some of our other uh, uh, people uh, kind of host this show over the last couple of weeks, and it constantly amazes me uh, that we have people from nearly every country. It seems like Croatia. Hello, Dubai, New York, Amsterdam, India. Fantastic. Super cool. It's such a uh, kind of global community coming together for, for these kind of conversations. Uh, we're definitely also going to be asking for your participation in just a bit here. Um, when we get to our secondary segments here after some of our news sections, what we're going to be doing is, and I want everyone to be aware and prepared for this, we're going to be doing a poll. And the question we're going to have for you is about challenges your security team is facing. So uh, when we get to our discussion later on, I'm really interested to hear from all of you because we'd like to feedback uh, kind of off of what we're seeing is going to be, you know, the largest trends in the responses there. So uh, hello, everyone. Hello from Guatemala. Hello from Belgium, India. Awesome. Malaysia. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Canada, Jason from UK. Very cool. So just checking through the InfoSec news this morning, I was uh, kind of you know cruising through Bleeping Computer and InfoSec Industry, some of those other kind of websites to aggregate all the news from other websites, uh, trying to figure out what we can talk about. And there's just like a wealth of topics here, right? Uh, we have tons of stuff going on in the news. Um, I'm here in Philadelphia, by the way, in the US and uh, Pennsylvania. And one of the things that hit home you know, uh, for us today is we have a, a primary election going on for the mayoral race and stuff like that. And our, our hometown newspaper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, actually had a cyber attack on Sunday that shut down the ability to do distribution of the news, arguably before one of the very important you know, uh, election days this year, uh, one of the most critical times. And I'm not sure if that was timed or intentional or not, but like even that sort of thing, right? This is all over the news and, and uh, the kind of impacts we're seeing uh, ransomware bringing more co uh, companies down and things like that. So definitely some of the stuff we want to talk about. Hello, everybody. We see folks from Saudi Arabia, Oman, California, The Hague. We've got everyone joining us from all over. Iran, Colombia. Amazing. Wish we had a, a way of counting the countries we had people here from. All right, so I think now that we've kind of got everyone in the room here, uh, let's make a transition over to our first section of uh, Wake Just an InfoSec for today. So first off, we're gonna have news bites given to you from Michelle Peterson and Thomas Wolf. So without any further ado, let's transition over to them for some of our uh, news bites for the day. Hello, 
Hello, and welcome to Wait Just an InfoSec News Bite, your source for expert commentary on the most significant cybersecurity news happening across the globe. I'm Michelle Peterson here in the SANS studio. Let's dive right in to this week's cybersecurity news bites. First up, earlier this month, President Biden invited the CEOs of leading AI companies Alphabet, Anthropic, Microsoft, and OpenAI to the White House to discuss AI safety. In the meeting, the Biden administration laid out its plans for responsible AI development. Now, concerns were raised by tech ethicists about why the White House would invite companies who have, in the eyes of some, been the purveyors of unethical AI development. Others believe that the Biden administration arranged the gathering to send a message to all AI companies that the government is watching them. Separately, as part of its efforts to ensure responsible AI use, the White House will also be organizing an event at the popular DEF CON conference held this August, where the algorithms from top AI developers will be exposed to rigorous vetting. So, AI developers, just how rigorous will it be? I mean, I'm sure that question will keep you up at night for the next several months. Turning now to WordPress news. You may remember our May 2nd News Bytes segment about the decades-old eval PHP WordPress plugin being used to inject malicious PHP code into web pages. Well, WordPress plugin vulnerabilities continue their scourge, and it probably isn't going to stop anytime soon, seeing as 40% of websites on the internet use WordPress. A cross-site scripting vulnerability in the WordPress Advanced Custom Fields plugin could be exploited to steal information and perform actions with the user's privileges. The plugin has at least 2 million active installs, and users are being urged to update the plugin to version 6.1.6 or newer. And while cross-site scripting is no longer on the OWASP top 10 list as a standout vulnerability, it is included in the injection grouping, which features third on the list. So experts advise that if you are a WordPress shop, patch early and patch as often as apps are updated. And if you'd like to read more about the May 2nd WordPress plugin vulnerability, be sure to subscribe to our twice weekly News Bytes newsletter at sans.org backslash News Bytes and check out our full archive. In Microsoft News, the world's largest software developer is making more big moves to secure its products. Last week, we brought you the story about Microsoft rewriting Windows libraries in the Rust programming language. Well, this week, Microsoft announced that it is transitioning on-prem Exchange Server 2019 environments from Basic Auth to Auth 2.0, aka Modern Auth. Basic Auth is a legacy authentication method with some serious drawbacks, most notably sending credentials in plain text and not supporting MFA. While this transition targets Exchange Server 2019, customers running Exchange Server 2016 can, under certain circumstances, support Modern Auth. Microsoft initially said it would not roll out Modern Auth to on-prem environments, however, reversed that decision last year after announcing the delay of the next version of Exchange Server until 2025. And those are your SANS News Bites for the week. For more critical cybersecurity news and commentary from some of the sharpest minds in InfoSec, don't forget to subscribe to the SANS News Bytes newsletter, your twice-weekly summary and analysis of the most significant cybersecurity developments at sans.org backslash newsbytes. Thanks again. I'm your host, Thomas Wolf. I hope to see you again next time. So, uh, we have got to the point here where we can uh, ask for a little participation from the audience. So, we're trying something here where we're going to be asking, what is your SOC's biggest challenge? And we would love to hear from you, uh, whether you know you're, you're familiar with your security operations center or not. I I'm sure not everyone here is a SOC analyst or a SOC manager, but to the best of your knowledge, right? What is your security team struggling with in terms of either whether it's detection capability or tools or budgeting or just detection of advanced attacks? 
If you scan that QR code or you go to slido.com and you type in that little number there, uh, there's going to be a spot for you to type in whatever your answer to that question is. It's always interesting to see what people are kind of commonly struggling with. And I'm, I have some predictions on what it might be, but we're definitely interested to see some of the answers that we'll get from the crowd here. So over the next couple minutes, if you could scan that QR code and type in what your security team is struggling with in 2023, I uh, would love to be able to talk about that in our next segment. So go ahead and check that out. Slide is a really, really cool way for us to kind of do back and forth interaction for this. So if you've seen our, our previous broadcast, you would have seen it before. Um, but definitely throw in uh, whatever answers you have there and we can have a discussion about that uh, in our next segment when we get to that. So with that, uh, before we get to our kind of uh, presentation and discussion on security uh, operations centers, threats and opportunities, uh, we're going to cut over to one quick segment here with Karen Evans, who's going to be talking about our uh, um, small business cyber summit event and why cyber, uh, why small and medium businesses need to pay as, atten as much attention to cybersecurity as anybody else. So go ahead and uh, roll that clip and we will be right back in just a minute. And in the meantime, please start filling in some of those Slido polls and we can get to you with some feedback on those answers. Talk to you in a bit. Hi, I'm Karen Evans, the Managing Director of the Cyber Readiness Institute. And I wanna share three reasons why small and mid-sized businesses should be concerned and want to embrace cybersecurity. And the first reason is because of ransomware. Ransomware is not going away. Uh, a lot of times small and medium businesses think that yet they will never be attacked, that you'll never be attacked. But many times you become an opportunity because people are in your trading partners networks, which that gets me to the second point about being a good trading partner. Everyone is somehow involved in the global supply chain. Small and medium businesses are critical to the global supply chain. So it's important that you become a good trading partner and embrace cybersecurity and a culture of cybersecurity, which is what the Cyber Readiness Institute is focused on, which is creating a culture of being cyber ready and providing those resources. So the last point that I want to focus on is the summit that SANS is doing, that we're doing jointly with them, which is going to outline some of the outstanding issues that are facing you as a small and medium business, but also provide solutions for you so that you can be cyber ready and be part of the global supply chain and grow as a business. All right, we are back. So. Without further ado, uh, our feature segment of today. I'm really, really excited for this. I uh, always love having a conversation with these two individuals we're bringing on here. So I'd like to bring on uh, my kind of co-hosts here, uh, Mark Orlando and Christian Vidu. Welcome, guys. Hey, John. How's it going? Hey, John. How are you both doing this morning? Fantastic. Or afternoon I'm for you, great. Christian. <laughs> this afternoon, yes, in my case. <laughs> so I brought on uh, two of my favorite instructors in the kind of security operations space, because as we all know, that's the theme of today. So before we jump into the conversations and look at some of the Slido poll results, which I know are coming in now, I'd love to just jump into some quick intros from both of you. Christian, if you could go first and do like maybe a one minute intro and Mark is you and you as well, and then we'll look at some of the results we brought in. Sure. My name is Christian Vidu. I'm one of the SEC 450 instructors in SANS. My background has been always through, through the blue, blue team. I've worked uh, in national socks. I've worked in energy sector for a while. I've worked in government. And right now I'm uh, more towards consulting and still working with the government and national level, uh, national level entities, working on detection and incident response. Awesome. And Mark, over to you. Yeah, hi, Mark Orlando. I'm a SANS certified instructor. I'm also an instructor for the SEC 450 class. And as you know, the co-author of Management 551, Building and Leading SOC Teams. Uh, like Christian, I've spent most of my career in cyber defense and security operations, uh, both as an analyst and as a leader, manager, and executive. And I'm also the co-founder and CEO of Bionic, which is a cybersecurity startup focused on helping security teams do what they do uh, more efficiently, more effectively. 
Fantastic. Thank you both for joining. So if we could jump over to the Slido poll here, I'm interested to see what some of the biggest things. Oh, I totally knew it. I knew that was going to be the answer. <laughs> awesome. So uh, looks like from what we've got selected here, uh, some of the most common problems, and these are things we talk about in class tons of times. So I'm, that's why I'm not surprised by this. Alert fatigue, false positives, burnout, detection, uh, and then some of the other ones here, we see wearing multiple hats, human error, point products, skills and knowledge, shadow IT, of course, uh, time consuming analysis, inventory, assurance, AI. Yeah, we got to definitely got to hit on the AI factor in, in a second here. Um, one of the things I think that we should maybe start out with here is perhaps uh, the burnout factor. I know that's one thing that's always on everyone's mind and it is a good kind of a segue into some of these other deeper technical conversations here. So uh, Mark, Christian, any kind of thoughts you want to lead into on um, the times that you have worked in a SOC where you have either seen burnout kind of manifest and, and how you've seen that addressed in a way uh, that has kind of uh, worked towards taking care of the problem and how teams can make that something they can stay away from? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start, I guess. Um, so I, I find it interesting. I'm glad we we put up the results there as like a word cloud because as I'm sure you both noticed, so many of those things are like related. We've got alert fatigue and false positives. And um, I think, you know, despite many of the advancements we've made in defense uh, with technology and um, automation, you know, the, this continues to be a major issue. And I think a lot of it comes down to, um, you know, we're really still treating our people, right, which are really hard to come by. Uh, you know, we're talking a lot of expertise, a lot of training, we're expecting them to do a lot of different things um, and, and bring these advanced skills to the table. But then ultimately, we're still treating them like cogs in a machine where it's like you sit in the chair, I'm just going to throw a bunch of stuff at you. Uh, it's going to be a lot of the same stuff every single day. And you're going to have to do a lot of manual repetitive work on those same, more or less the same things day in and day out. And I think there's still a fundamental mismatch in the skills and abilities we're, we're hiring for and the actual work that we're expecting people to do. Yeah. Christian, anything you wanted to add to that? I also think that these are somehow tied into each other because if you noticed, if we the problem with the, with the shortage of people ties into the burnout eventually. We don't have enough people. Most of the socks that I've worked with, even at a higher level, have a challenge finding good, uh, good analysts. And this ties into the amount of workload that ends up with each analyst. And even from the other perspective, from small and, small and medium businesses, since we, we talked earlier about it, we had the short presentation earlier about it. There we have the challenge of uh, one person or a small team of person wearing multiple hats. So it ties in eventually into the burnout with, without the ability to use tools and without the ability to, to find open source tools, especially in the case of small and medium businesses that don't have the budgets to have a good SOAR and a large spend in a, on a large platform, this will eventually lead to, lead to a burnout. Yeah, I know when I was a SOC analyst, and and I know it's been the same with you. We've all kind of worked in the uh, you know alert grind kind of life. Um, certainly, there's a couple things that have brought around the, those kind of feelings of burnout, and I think you know we, we cover these in, in some of the classes. But uh, the things that really stick out in my mind here is overwork, as you kind of mentioned, Christian, and then the other one being the variety of work that people do. There's actually some research out there on this, and I can throw out the short link here too. Uh, if anyone goes to sec450.com slash burnout, uh, there's actually a short link to a paper there that is uh, scientific research on what causes burnout in SOC analysts. And some of the, the things they identified there were growth, skills, empowerment, and creativity. And basically what they're saying is like, those factors are all related. And if you do not have a SOC where people are seeing a variety of tasks, feel like they're growing, kind of building up their skills day to day and uh, not being able to kind of exercise those creative sparks of ideas like, oh, I, I could make an automation. I could make this thing better. Um, you know, that's not going to be a team that's going to be fun to work for. And kind of on the flip side there, you know, when I talk to people, when we go kind of teaching, I, I'm sure it's probably the same for you guys. Uh, anytime someone's like, hey, I'm in a sock job and I'm not a big fan of it. I'm always like, oh, why is that? Right. I talk to them. It's a lot of times a lack of variety on the job. Uh, when you have one 
kind of role where it's just like you look at the alert and then you say true or false positive and you pass it on. Uh, you get bored of that, understandably, fairly quickly, right? So kind of the long and short of this, uh, I would say check out that paper, but also consider, is there a way that you can add more variety to your job? Is there a way that you can uh, get some kind of creative freedom to create new tools, create new automation, those sorts of things? In my experience and in when I talk to students who, who don't enjoy their job as much, it seems like those are the, some of the biggest factors that are lacking. And, and kind of my goal in, in uh, teaching, and I know it's the same for Mark and Christian, if I can speak for them, is making sock jobs fun is very, very important to me. I want that to be a job everyone enjoys. So I'm glad that kind of came out first. Uh, and there's the, the short link to that uh, paper if anyone's interested in reading that. It's really, really interesting read. Um, if we could flash back to the slider real quick as people had, had keep... Um, entering things. I, I figured so, false positives was the second one that popped up here. So uh, false positives, big topic here. Um, this is something that obviously can also like be fed, well, interplay with burnout, right? The more false positives you have, the more likely you're like, oh, it's just another one of these things. It's alert fatigue. It's constantly happening. Uh, Mark, Christian, if I was to ask you something about where do you think the root problem from false positives come from? I'd be curious to hear your answer. Do you think it's like a, an under definition of what we're looking for, default rule sets? Where do you see the biggest problems come from false positives and what kind of solutions do you offer? I think I'll start with the, well, this time. Most of the time, I think this is coming from default rule sets. It's my experience that default rule sets are very broad in most products, which means that not all of them will apply to the environment where everyone is working. And it's also something that's uh, in the interest of vendors in the end. They have, it's in their interest to send as many detections as possible so that they can push as to push their product as being the best in all fields. It's the, there is no, there, I'm not sure if there is a quick fix, fix for this. There are a number of approaches. One of them being starting to change that default rule set. And we actually talk in the course about some some approaches, starting with the start, starting from the full default rule, rule set and reducing it, removing the false positives, going with an 80-20 approach, seeing what's the alert that generates most of the of the detections and tuning those out, or from the other perspective, starting from zero, removing all of the rules and just adding each each one of those that is of interest to you one by one. Each one of them has advantages and disadvantages and advantages and disadvantages. And in the end, it's a long conversation which one is best. It comes down to, to the environment of each, uh, each organization, probably. Yeah, absolutely. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I, I think Christian you know, said, said it all. Um, and I, I want to reiterate um, the idea of tuning. I mean, fundamentally, uh, you know, an alert by definition is something that shouldn't be happening all the time. And so if you're seeing the same alerts multiple times a day, every day, I mean, I, I don't call that, you know, an issue. I call that normal activity. And maybe that's not normal activity that you want happening in your environment. But, um, you know, you, at some point you can't expect uh, your team to treat those as aberrations or, you know, things that kind of raise an alarm. This is where alert fatigue comes in. So I think, you know, one of the things that, that I really want to reiterate that Christian mentioned was, you, know, you have to have a strategy to tune those alerts, right? Don't give those bad alerts a pass, uh, whether it's tuning down slowly from default or eliminating everything and building back up, as Christian described. Um, you know, we have to get a handle on these. Uh, no vendor is going to know your environment, so we can't expect uh, a vendor to have really solid, accurate alerting out of the box. So anything that is high volume and maybe not that accurate um, you know, that should be the result of a deliberate decision you're making uh, to say that I'm going to let this alert fire more times than is really necessary because that threat is so important to me that I'm willing to put up with some false positives in order to make sure that I don't miss the true positives. But we shouldn't just kind of let those things happen and go unchecked. We should be making those decisions uh, you know, deliberately and repeatedly. Yeah, to, to follow on to that, let me ask you a quick follow-up question on that. Um, any comments or thoughts on how we prioritize the rule sets? Because certainly, as you said, right, some things are, are very high priority, but you may have a, a high false positive 
kind of rate coming out of that rule versus things that are low priority with the false positive. Where do you start with generating the rule set just that a team should have? Is there any approach really? That, uh, Christian as well, feel free to jump in on that. Um, if, if you were to be starting from scratch with a rule set to create something that was high fidelity, uh, what rules would you prioritize and how would you go about finding the types of things to put in that rule set? It depends on yeah, the I mean, I think a lot of it. Oh, go, go. <laughs> I think we were about to say the exact same answer. Go ahead, Christian. <laughs> I think it depends on the environment. Personally, I'm a big fan of starting with the large number of, of alerts, turning everything on and seeing what triggers. This is especially if I'm going in a new environment where I have limited visibility and I don't know the environment. If it's somewhere where I work, probably I already know what I should be expecting. So I will start from zero. But in a new environment, somewhere where I haven't worked, where I'm, if I'm consulting and I don't know what to expect in there, I would probably go with the turn everything on and start reducing everything that's uh, too high, start trimming it down based on number of alerts first. And then when we are down to a manageable number, try to see which one of the alert, where, where each one of the alerts is pointing me which phase of the, the kill chain? Is it closer to action or objectives? Or is it something that's closer to the initial phase of the attack, which can wait longer? This is how I would generally go, uh, go about this. Anything you want to add to that, Mark? No, I just, uh, you know, we talked about the 80-20 rule before and, you know, starting with those really noisy alerts and kind of addressing those first. And I think, um, you know, another thing Christian mentioned that I, I completely agree with, of course, is that organizational context. So if you're going to try to start tuning your alerts and trying to figure out, you know, what's truly an issue, what you want in your alerting, if you don't have a really solid handle on the environment first, what applications, what systems are in place what users are doing, uh, how network traffic flows through the environment, things like that, then you're not really gonna be in a great position to uh, make good decisions about what alerting looks like. So I think there's certainly some homework that you have to do, some research into your own environment, collect that internal intelligence and let that guide some of your, um, your alerting decisions. Yeah, absolutely. I was just looking at some of the comments here that we have coming in. Uh, we had Bayram asking about, uh, you know, what kind of rules are good for SOC detections and SIM rule sets, Snort, Yara, Sigma. Um, and also Kevin asking about what constitutes a false positive and what you kind of brought up there about threat intelligence. Uh, that's kind of the, the thing I wanted to add on to what you all said is my opinion on this is really prioritization of rules that are going to align with the attacks that you expect to occur to a company like yours in your industry that are also going to be a uh, high impact. So how would you go and you figure that sort of thing out? You would have to go and read the news. You would have to talk to your threat intelligence vendors. You absolutely have to collect all of the IOCs from all of the incidents that have occurred in the past in your own environment, push all that together in some kind of threat intelligence platform, and then try to uh, do some attribution to those to these groups, right? And say, oh, this was potentially gonna be a ransomware attack. This was potentially APT, you know, one, two, three, whoever it was. Um, if you can find those attacks or if you can get any kind of hint that there is an attack group that is doing some kind of attack and you can specifically pick it out in your rule set, those are the rules in my mind that you deal with the false positives for because they're such high impact. They really swamp out all the like, oh, it makes some noise. Yeah, it might make some noise, but it also might save your organization millions of dollars of outages if the whole everything goes down and you can't make product for the next day or your power goes out right in your in your city. Uh, all of those things, it's probably worth a few false positives and you do your best to tune them um, to that end. Right. I guess to, to resummarize what I'm saying, there, threat intelligence led rule sets are going to be uh, the answer to the question that was being posed in the chat room. Now, there was also the question about what creates a, uh, what is a false positive versus anomaly? That's actually another question we dive deep into in, uh, in 450. But there are kind of two different types of rules. There are rules that identify things that are a known bad hash or a known bad domain name. And when those things go off, if the rule was fed with a list that actually has correct listings of hashes and domain names on it, then it's right. And you're looking for the accuracy of the list and the rule matches it. Very simple logic. If the domain is on this list, it's bad. You see that alert, it's bad. There's no question about it. Um, the quality of the alert is tied to the quality of the list that feeds the alert. There's the anomaly alert, though. That's a very different thing. And I think that's where a lot of false positives come from and the tie-in kind of here. 
when you get alerts that are anomaly alerts, my favorite example of that is like John logged in from a new computer or John logged in from a new country where he's never logged in before. Even if the rule is right and it's accurately detecting me logging in from one of those you know, new places, it doesn't guarantee that something bad has happened. <clears throat> and so when you look at those kind of anomaly alerts, uh, those are the things that tend to create false positives, but we still need to keep those around as well because there's a lot of attacks that we don't know the domain, na uh, domain names for. We don't know the hashes for. And so it's an acknowledgement that there are unknown unknowns, but it's your anomaly rule set that may be causing more and more false positives. So within those, if you can look at your threat intelligence, you can kind of map out what you can read about certain attack groups and how those attacks happen, and then turn that into these are the rules that identify those things as a priority. Uh, those are the things you definitely want to keep and do your best to tune. And then there are other ones that are maybe like, eh, we don't really know why we care about this rule. Um, the check is, if you look at the rule and you say, I don't know what this is detecting or why I care, those are the ones you might want to cut out and say like, eh, not important. The other thing is just metrics, right? Can you go back to the last month and say, these are the rules, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. These are the rules that have been firing the most often over the last month. High volume alerting is bad in all cases. If it's high volume and correct, you have a problem because the problem keeps happening over and over and over again. You need some more prevention technology to stop that bad thing from happening so much. If it's high volume false positive, you probably just have to add an extra condition to the rule and tune it down and say, oh, all the false positives are coming from one user, one system, one URL, one website, whatever it is, and figure those sorts of things out. So those are the kind of things that we like deep in, uh, deep diving and, and talking about uh, when we get into this. Um, can we bring up the Slido one more time and see what other kind of... Uh, answers have come up in there. Let's pick one more thing that was on the popular uh, list here. So we kind of talked detection and false positives and alert fatigue all together there. Um, wearing multiple hats. So that is a potentially popular one there. That one I would not have predicted as as much. Uh, this to me might be the call out of people having too much work and too wide of a scope uh, in a sock. Uh, Mark and Christian, from the socks that you guys work with, what do you think you, you typically see? Do you see people that are overburdened with too much work of a wide variety of scope? Or do you think it's something that's like, oh, I, I just do alerts, but even that's kind of overwhelming me? Uh, any kind of thoughts mm -hmm. on uh, breadth of activity in the typical sock and whether that's a core problem you're seeing or not? I think a, a fairly common problem based on, on what I've seen is uh, the competition between daily ongoing activities like reviewing alerts or responding to incidents or doing threat hunting and project based tasks like deploying a new tool or writing a you know a, some one off report or something like that and i think that that is a, a kind of a push and pull that i see very often which is like we're underwater, we're fighting fires, you know, we're responding to all of these alerts and trying to handle those, but also we have these very real improvement initiatives and taskings and other project work that we have to get done also. So which is the priority? Do you want the new tool or do you want me to address the, you know, the urgent issues that are popping up? So that's like one that I see um, happens a lot. And many times the SOC is doing a lot of project work and we don't often track that work in any meaningful way. Um, and we don't really incorporate that into our metrics oftentimes. And so that can sometimes be like a hidden sort of sunk cost that's taking time away from alerts, but in a lot of cases is no less important. I think that's, uh, that's pretty common. Christian, any thoughts on the, the overburdened sock and any solutions you can uh, provide to people? I think Mark covered most, uh, most of the things. There is one thing that I see also, it was mentioned by, by Kevin on uh, the tiered versus tierless socks. And this is, this, is, this is something that we also cover in Sec450. Maybe it's worth discussing it a little bit because it's right. In tiered socks, the reason for, uh, for the overburden, I'm not so sure that it's because of the multiple hats. In tierless socks, there is the advantage of being able to shift to, 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 shift to different positions, to change hats and work in various... You know, have, have a varied environment where you, where you are working. But of course, this can come with the disadvantage of feeling swamped at some point. So this is a trade-off that's difficult to hit a balance. Not sure if I have a good, good advice which one is good or which one is bad. I've been happier in tierless socks. 
though uh, I've worked mostly in tiered. Yeah, I would agree. Um, th this is a conversation that we have in both classes because it's an interesting kind of divide in the way that teams are run. Uh, tiered versus tierless in my mind is when the alert comes in, is there one group of people that always is going to have their eyes on it first and then escalate it very much like a help desk, right? Tier one can't solve the problem. It goes to tier two, as opposed to tierless where you have this pool of issues and everyone kind of works together to get them done. Uh, what I try to emphasize to people is in a lot of cases in information security, there is no uh, globally correct answer. There are answers that optimize for certain outcomes. And so when you are looking at a tiered SOC, the way I see it and, and the way I think it's optimizing for process uh, is that it's, it's going to be a predictable flow of this person sees it, this person sees it. They're going to see it, you know, in this order, uh, at kind of this time speed. And if you're an MSSP, if you're a very hierarchical, maybe government organization where you have to pass stuff up, stuff up the line, that can make a lot of sense, right? Uh, customers say, hey, when an alert happens, what's going to, you know, what's going to occur on your end? And you got to have an answer for that. Uh, I think I see that kind of a, a situation more in those kind of organizations where in private enterprise, where it's just a, a small sock, well, small or large, right? Um, I, I think there's a little bit more of the tierless sock fashion of uh, organization going on there. And with those, I think those are kind of optimizing more towards, hey, let's all kind of collectively work together. Let's figure out how to do these things. And it does take more management. There's less process there. But I think it can introduce more variety into people's day. Now, it very much depends on how you organize those two different groups. But uh, in my experience, which is working in a tier list SOC, uh, when I had uh, my previous job working at a large pharmaceutical company, we were tier list. We all kind of said like, hey, here's an interesting thing. And everyone was kind of working on a little bit of everything, asking for help, constantly growing. And if you were to form a tier uh, tiered SOC, sorry, sorry with um, more of a restricted, here's what you see, here's what you do, and then you go to the next one, there may be a little bit less kind of learning involved. So I, I can see either one working well, depending on what your business and what your mission of your SOC is. But it kind of depends on what you're aiming for and which one's going to be uh, the most kind of sustainable over the long term. And we always have to think about sustainability because security is never going to be over, right? The other thing I wanted to ask you both, uh, we have probably, I don't know, five, seven more minutes here. Um, AI, right? I knew it was going to come up. It came up uh, kind of in the chat room earlier. And, and it was one of those things I was going to ask regardless. Uh, this is one of those topics that it's clearly a game changer for society already. Uh, within the scope of the SOC, I would love to hear from you both. Where do you think the current capabilities of AI is going to be uh, taking like the capabilities of the, how, how is it going to change what the SOC is doing in the near term future? And also, have you used something like chat GPT for anything incredibly useful already? Um, I, I think it's all about assistive technology. And um, I, I, I don't want to be that, that person that says, oh, I've been saying this for years, but, but I haven't seen it for years. Um, <laughs> but I, I think, you know, one of the things that we can uh, take away from kind of the explosion of uh, you know, use of technologies like ChatGPT is um, it's really great as assistive technology. And I think that's something that the SOC sorely needs. I mean, we've been talking about burnout and alert fatigue and doing you know, all, this manual, all these manual tasks, being overburdened, wearing multiple hats. And a common thread there is you know, we have a capacity problem and we have a repetitive work problem. And I think AI is uniquely positioned as a tool to help us address that, not by replacing people um, or, you know, eliminating the, the creativity that, that humans sort of bring to the equation, but rather by adding in prompts and uh, helping to take some of those repetitive tasks off of the analyst's plate um, in a way that Frankly, I, I think some automation technologies have not been able to do without a lot of additional manual work. So I'm pretty excited about that. Um, you know, personally, I, I've played around with it, um, you know, doing everything from kind of helping me with report writing, uh, you know, phrasing, wording, things like that, to uh, generating hypotheses in investigative contexts. So, of course, in class, you know, we talk about doing security analysis, doing investigations and coming up with different theories and hypotheses is an important part of that. And so, you know, I've seen teams that are using tools like ChatGPT 
to, to generate those things without having to take a lot of additional time doing brainstorming, things like that. So I'm pretty excited about it. You know, I, I think like any new technology, we, we should proceed with caution, realizing that it's not not going to be a panacea, but I'm excited about the the promise of that assistive automation. Yeah, totally agree. Christian, what do you think? There is no, no, it's not, there is no hiding that I was a bit skeptical about the impact that uh, AI such as ChatGPT would have on the on the SOC because I assumed that very few SOCs would want to expose their data to an outside system. However, this has changed after Facebook released their open source and open sourced their model. And having played with the offline version of uh, the, the Facebook model and, I don't know, maybe eight or nine other uh, open source models that can be used in an offline environment, I'm actually now quite, mm, quite, uh, quite an adept of uh, using an uh, assistive AI in, uh, in the SOC. I'm, I don't think they are absolutely great. I don't think the answers are up to par compared to a very good analyst. But I think they are really good at providing some ex some level of explanations for the tier one uh, tier one uh, tier one analyst, and also what Mark said, uh, providing hypothesis. However, I I keep emphasizing this. I I'm a big fan of offline technologies. I'm I'm really not certain that socks are very open with sharing data from inside the sock to an to a third party software as a service vendor such as OpenAI. Yeah, it's, it's definitely going to be an interesting world that we bring ourselves into here. Um, just some kind of closing thoughts on this from my end. I want everyone to go try out some kind of uh, GPT, you know, the engine or whatever. Go just ask it to do something for you. If you haven't tried it out, it is truly magical. It's kind of scary and amazing. Ask for some code. Ask for it to brainstorm ideas to you. Uh, there is a, um, you know, a wealth of things it can produce for you. So. With that, I'll close up the conversation here. Thank you so much, guys, for joining me on this. Uh, always fun talking with you both. Uh, the crowd has the, the links to uh, catch you online. So if anyone's looking to interact on LinkedIn or otherwise, uh, you can find us there. So thank you so much for joining, and we'll catch you later. Thanks, John. Thank All you, right. John. Yep. All right. So uh, our next segment here, we just wanted to uh, give a quick shout out uh, to a project I've been working on recently. Uh, it's the Blueprint Podcast Season 4. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Blueprint Podcast, basically it is a podcast purely made for security operations center people who are looking to up their detections, learn about false positives and more. And what we've got in this uh, upcoming season, which is now on episode two being released uh, as of yesterday, which we're going to show you a clip from here in just a second. I got all of the authors from MITRE's 11 Strategies of a World Class Cybersecurity Operations Center to walk through the entire book with me, which is really, really cool. They're donating the hours on the weekends to record these things. So I am so gracious that they were able to do this. I think anyone that's watching this broadcast is really going to love it. So I wanted to give you all kind of a, a quick um, example of some of the conversations we're having. So let's queue up that video and we'll be right back. Yeah, and I want to I want to parse something out there, pun intended, um, in terms of the authority to do something versus the responsibility. One of the things that we think about having in the SOC charter is enabling it to do certain things that may not be its responsibility. And I'll pick out uh, scanning, for example, um, you know, what, when you're writing a charter, one of you, the, you, the listeners, don't necessarily get caught up in who's responsible for things, but rather focus on having a crisp statement, not measured in dozens of pages, but single digit pages, perhaps even single digit paragraphs, the things that the SOC is allowed and enabled to do. So even for, so for example, during incident response, the SOC may need to go scan some, some, some something on demand, even if it's not their responsibility to have a sustained scanning program. So just think about that nuance. Don't let the fine division of roles and responsibilities during what I'll characterize as peacetime drag down your ability to write crisp statements in this high level doc. Yeah, I know there's been plenty of times kind of in my experience and, and plenty of times students have told me about where they're like, 
hey, something's going on. They go to the group where, you know, it has the affected asset. They're like, hey, I need your logs, right? Or whatever, because they didn't have them. And they're like, no, who are you, right? I'm not going right. to give you my data. <laughs> That's actually like the top. That's actually like one of the top things is is an incident response. It's, it's getting digital artifacts and it's telling them others to do things. And this goes back to that cultural piece. Sometimes in some organizations, you need everything written down. And if it's not written down, people are going to reply to you with with fruity hand signals. Whereas in other organizations, they might be like, oh, you have security in your name. We should participate and listen. Yeah. Yeah, we definitely don't want to be like scrambling and wasting time trying to decide who's allowed to do what, right? When when things are going on and the attacker is progressing, it's not a case of like, oh, I don't want to give you my data. Like you need to keep things moving, right? Like we talked about with the OODA loop before. So right. um, yeah, this is in my mind, one of those things where you show up if someone doesn't believe you, you pull out the charter, you're like, here it is, it's signed, right? Management said I can get this data, right? And hopefully <laughs> that helps smooth things over. So I think that's one of the most important things here. And, and if people are wondering, do I need a charter? Uh, if you've ever run into that problem, that might be the thing that a charter helps solve for you. Um, anything else on charters before we kind of shift to talking about um, a very related topic, the organizational alignment and working with other groups and kind of where you report up through? Uh, yeah, it's what, really important to know what's not in the charter as well, right? So some organizations, some SOCs are not allowed to do the actual incident response, which is kind of odd, you know, so they can find stuff and then they have to hand it off somewhere else. If there's things like that, um, that's really important to document as well. So not just yeah, what you I, are doing, but what you're not doing. Yeah, <laughs> especially yep. if it's a key SOC function normally. Yeah, definitely. Ingrid? Yeah, and I would say practically, you know, you create the charter, it's signed by a particular executive, you need to be aware of changes in your organization and changes in expectations. And so, you know, a charter should be one of those documents that gets reviewed periodically to say, oh, is that is that person still here? Do we still have these authorities? Have they moved on? Is there somebody else who should be signing this? Um, or again, has the organization changed in a way that there are different things you need to be monitored or need to have access to? Um, so very much think of it as a, it's not the thing you do, it's the one of the first things you do in a starter sock, but it doesn't mean it's the last, you know, never to be seen again. Um, so definitely make sure it's on that rotation of how often are you gonna review it. Yeah, yeah. and, and dove, dovetailing off what Catherine said, you know, there's a laundry list, literally almost in 2.1.4 of all these other policies that the sock is gonna lean on. And it starts with things like, a consent to monitoring policy and an acceptable use policy. So much of what the SOC does is going to be reliant on those. But to her point, you know, there's going to be a, a much longer list of policies or other similar charters by other organizations where they say in writing, oh, this is what we're responsible for. And again, some of them might be really short. Some of them might not exist. But, uh, you know, warning signs, if they don't exist, um, you know, that, got, that lack of clarity could get you in trouble. So cool stuff, right? I'm really, really excited to uh, have the opportunity to speak with those authors. Uh, there are 11 chapters, technically 12, because there's a chapter zero, because we count from zero, we're nerds, right? So there's at least 12 chapters. We're gonna do a live round table discussion. Uh, and these are part of season four of the podcast. So if you weren't familiar with the Blueprint podcast, we have the QR code up there. If you just go to sans.org, uh, slash blueprint or search it on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or anywhere you get podcasts, you'll be able to find it there. The other thing I want to shout out is, as you just saw, for this season, for the very first time, we actually have video. So if you go onto YouTube and you search for Blueprint there on the SANS Cyber Defense channel, we have the video of everyone as well. And the reason I call that out is one, I know some people just like listening and watching the things on YouTube and getting the visual instead of the audio. But also with YouTube, it's a lot easier to share specific sections. So if you hear something in that discussion, which is all about building a sock and making a sock awesome, and you're like, oh, my manager needs to hear this, right? You can hit the share button and then link it right out to that specific moment in the video and then, you know, pass it to your friend where that's a, that's a little bit harder to do in podcasts sometimes. Some apps support it, but not all, uh, all of them. So YouTube's really great for that. So uh, with that, I think we can about wrap up this episode. Uh, hope you all enjoyed the conversation we had today. There's one final thing I want to shout out, and that is we have the Blue Team Summit coming as well with a bunch of incredible speakers. Some of the folks from that podcast, in fact, uh, we're going to be doing the uh, the live uh, panel discussion there. And Carson is going to be doing a keynote on day two. So some more awesome information from them. And the summit is free. 
So if you go to sans.org slash blue team dash summit, or you just Google sans blue team summit, you'll find it virtual conference. Don't have to travel. All that information is available and will be, uh, you know, freely broadcast to you wherever you are in the world. And I know that we are all over the world. So with that, I will let you all get back to, I'm sure your busy days. Thank you so much for joining us here uh, at SANS with Wait Just an InfoSec, and we will catch you next time. Have a great one.